everybody and welcome to another short clip of Palliative Education. And today we're going to be talking about one of the real fundamental concepts of palliative medicine, which is the World Health Organization pain ladder. So, what is it? Well, it's a really simple three-step approach to titrating analgesia. So let's just take a look at what it is um, and, and how the approach might be used for a patient. So what the World Health Organization suggests is that really for anybody who's got pain, you start at the bottom of the ladder on step one. And step one of the World Health Organization pain ladder is non-opioid analgesics. What they're saying is that's where you start when you see a patient with pain. You start with simple things. So non-opioid analgesics would be things like paracetamol or aspirin. The sorts of things that if you had mild pain, you'd go into the chemist or the supermarket and you'd just be able to get stuff off the shelf. That's step one. Now, if that doesn't work, then you move to step two, which is weak opioids. Now, weak opioids will be familiar with um, things like codeine, dihydrocodeine. Um, you can probably include tramadol in that step, although of the weak opioids, it's probably a little bit more potent. But they would be the next step, and you would add those into your step one analgesia. So just to recap, step one, simple things like paracetamol, aspirin, if that doesn't work, you would then move to a weak opioid, so perhaps paracetamol and codeine. And then only if step one and step two haven't worked, would you go to step three which would be the introduction of a strong opioid. Again, in combination with your non-opioid medication. So if you've gone through step one and step two, you might then have the patient on something like morphine and paracetamol together. Now, obviously there's lots of other drugs um, that are used for pain, things like steroids, neuropathic agents, that sort of thing. All of those, we group as a, as a group of drugs called adjuvants, which don't actually form part of the main World Health Organization pain ladder. So again, just to recap, step one, non-opioids. Moving to step two, which would be the addition of a weak opioid. And then if that doesn't work, up to step three. Now, that sounds really simple and there will be a lot of people who will be saying well that's that's just common sense isn't this just a way of, of dressing up something that really we should all be doing and just it should be just intuitive and to a certain extent absolutely um, We've all been trained really now to follow this stepwise approach to analgesia. But what's really important to understand in terms of why we have this is actually what we were doing before its inception. So the World Health Organization pain ladder was developed in 1986. And before then, before we were using this system, managing analgesia for a patient was a little bit more gung-ho. So you might have a clinician who had a patient with, say, cancer, who would go, patient's got cancer, you must have bad pain. Therefore, we'll give you a strong painkiller like morphine. But then we'd go to another patient who might have a headache where you would go, that must be quite mild. We'll give you a mild painkiller for that. And so what you found was that actually you might end up getting strong painkillers that you didn't need. Um, and equally, that 
you might actually get underdosed just because there was an assumption made about what sort of pain you had and what sort of pain relief you might need to manage it. So the inception of the pain ladder really got us thinking about the concept of titration. That we start low and then we titrate up in steady increments. And that, you know, even when we've got patients on strong opioids, there's almost an extension to the pain ladder of steps four and five where you go through that titration stepwise of increasing the dose. And I've done another video on how to titrate strong opioids, which you can look at. But it also helps us in terms of understanding perhaps where we need to go in terms of uh, opioid conversion, particularly when we're moving from weak opioids to strong opioids. So, Going back to the fundamental of the ladder, if we say that we've got a patient who we've, we've worked through step one and step two, and we're thinking about moving them to step three, well, if we've had them on weak opioids, let's say just for, for argument's sake, codeine. The maximum dose of codeine that's recommended for a patient is 240 milligrams. So if we've got a patient on 240 milligrams and we want to move them up to step three, what's that gonna look like? Well, morphine is 10 times as potent as codeine. So if our patient's on 240 milligrams of uh, codeine, that e actually equals 24 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent. So even when you're on step two of the World Health Organization pain ladder, you're still actually getting a significant analgesic dose if you convert it to oral morphine equivalent. But if we're gonna go up another step, obviously that implies that we need to make an increase here. So, Again, following the principle in my, in my other video about how you would tie trades, and generally you tend to use about a third increase. If we're moving a patient up to step three of the ladder, you're beginning to get into the realms of about 40 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent at that stage. And in terms of what that might look like in practice, that might be, say, a patient going on to MS Contin 20 milligrams twice a day. So, it's very simple and straightforward, but behind it lies some very important messages about how we manage patients in a stepwise fashion. And crucial to it is this sense of titration, and particularly important is that we actually go through this approach for every patient and that we don't kind of make assumptions about what their pain might need in terms of analgesic requirements. We actually have to go through each step and prove whether it works or doesn't work before we move to another step. And if you stick to that and those basic principles, then actually your management of pain in patients will remain consistent you'll run into less problems with toxicity, and that's all for the greater good of your patients. So I hope that's been helpful, and hopefully I'll see you for another short clip of power of education soon.